Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by Las Vegas Motor Speedway, America's racing showplace. I said, I'm in the upper 1% of what we do in this sport. I go, I'm never quitting. He laughed. He goes, oh, you will. He goes, and what's sad? You don't have a plan. It was about developing other people to be better. And as a team, as a group of people working towards a common goal, we got there. Well, if you can distract the guy, they swap the carburetor and stick the (laughs) illegal carburetor on, right? And then seal it. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. There was a guy, Steve Toki, who um, I credit a a lot of my business acumen to. And uh, Steve was the brand manager for Gatorade when they were owned by Quaker Oats. And he would come to the racetrack, make sure people had hats and Gatorade coolers and Gatorade. And so he would come to my pit during the race and sometimes help, like catch a tire that come to the wall. Maybe he'd do the pit sign. You know, maybe he wouldn't. But, you know, through those relationships that we cultivate in motorsports, especially when it rains or, you know, there's time delays and we just stand around, we get to know people. So I'd known Steve, I don't know, 10 years. And he said, next time you're in Atlanta, let's get together. And before there was a racetrack there, um, I went to sign autographs at True Value Hardware, at the National Hardware Show. And, uh, you know, the guys in the trade show are like, hey, man, we're going to the titty bar afterwards. And I was like, guys, I don't pay girls like me. I just don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I'm not doing it. Thank you, but no thanks. And so I called Toki up and said, hey, let's get together. And uh, we sat at a little restaurant, and he looked across the table at me, and he said, what do you do for a living? <laughs> I kind of laughed, and I was like, that's funny. And he goes, no, what do you do? And I said, you know, I, I take, you know, 300 of the most talented craftsmen there are we take raw materials and we we build a product that goes 200 miles an hour and he's like you know and i said all right um so i take 300 people with the biggest egos in the world there's no college football coach that has anything on me and he's like no and i said dude i give and he said you rub elbows with Fortune 500 people all day, every day, and they want to be you. I said, hmm. And he looked at me. He goes, you don't get it. And I said, no. <laughs> and he goes, I know you don't, and that's why we're having this conversation. And he grabbed the ketchup bottle, and he set it in the middle of the table, and he said, you're going to put that in the Lowe's Home Improvement Center. What are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to call Jeff Ulrich, who at that time was the brand manager, DK, one of DK's sons, right? Carolyn and DK, um, who uh, is at SMI now. Uh, So um, Jeff has moved up through the sport, but at that time he was the brand manager over at at Lowe's. And I said, hey, I'll call Jeff. It'll be on the shelf next week. And he goes, you're going to call Jeff. Do you get that? Do you understand that? He said, he goes, you can call the vice president of Coca-Cola. He'll take your call and ask you guys when you're getting together next. I go, yeah. And he goes, do you understand that? And I said, yeah. And he goes, no, you don't. He said, you have a Rolodex of corporate America that not will only take your call, will ask when you guys are getting together next. He goes, the deal with Jeff? He goes, if you walk up to Lowe's right now and knock on the front door, it's two years to get to anybody that actually can make a decision. And you're just going to call Jeff? What's your exit strategy? And I said, exit strategy? Out of NASCAR? Yeah. 
Well, he didn't say it like that. Yeah, he, yeah, he goes, yeah. what's your yeah. exit strategy? And I was like, exit strategy? I said, I'm in the upper 1% of what we do in this sport. I go, I'm never quitting. And he laughed. He goes, oh, you will. He goes, and what's sad? You don't have a plan. You don't have an exit strategy. And I was like, wow. And he goes, if you'll allow me to mentor to you, I will teach you how corporate America every day shows up in blue jeans, tennis shoes, and a T-shirt, sits next to you on the pit box, and watches you look at people and shit happens. And they're going, what did he just, how did he do that? I'm not yelling. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not even talking. I'm just looking at people and stuff is happening. And people like Ed Renzi, the CEO of McDonald's, is sitting next to me on the pit box going, how do I get this talent of communication where eight people can reach into a toolbox at the same time, not bump into each other, and all grab a different tool to get something done? And how do I take that discipline into corporate America? And that's how I got into corporate America and the relationships that we gained in racing that we thought were just people showing up as sponsors were truly people that needed the talents that we learn in motorsports. Not about cars going around the track. That's a result. Okay. All right. It's deep. <laughs> Sounds good, man. All right. So you, you, that happened in November of 90 with Mike. Uh, the next June, still talking about Ricky's team. Yeah. Uh, Ricky Rudd and Davey Allison at uh, Sears Point. <sighs> <laughs> I love I love pe- asking people about that uh, just to get their reaction, just to get their initial reaction. So the Ricky Rudd thing goes all the way back to uh, Carolyn and DK Ulrich. So um, Ricky and Carolyn, um, brother and sister. Yeah. Right. So it was Carolyn Rudd, and right. so she married DK Ulrich. So Ricky's first car first race was out of DK's shop when Ricky was, was nobody. Yeah. Right. So that relationship with Ricky goes, you know, all the way. Your relationship. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, so watching the evolution of his professionalism in the sport and his talent, um, was, was really neat. And we called him rooster for a number of reasons. And cause there, he had a hot head spot. He didn't show it a lot, but, there was a he was hot headed sometimes. What was your reaction when everything happened at the end? Um, I was. I expected. <laughs> <laughs> you expected him to get into Davy, or you expected NASCAR to penalize him? No, I expect him to get into him. Okay, all right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, I can't. I can't help what NASCAR does. I'm not even sure they can help what they do. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I'm yeah. not talking despairingly. Right, right. You know, the blind leading the blind, they can't, you know, they don't know what we're doing on our side of the fence, right? And we just kind of laugh at what they do on their side of the fence, right? Uh, it's a double-edged sword. You talked about going back over. Well, what happened that you left the five team? Um, so – Gary Dehart took over, uh-huh. and he wanted all his own guys. Yeah. So over evolution, you know, people left. Okay. All right. Right? It's very common in the sport when a crew chief takes over, he wants all his own guys. And, you yeah. Know, um, God bless him because uh, that's how people move around the sport, and that's how we all got talents from different people in the sport is, you know, us moving around. So you mentioned uh, Lake coming to you and, and asking why you weren't a crew chief. Had that ever been a goal of yours, or did it just kind of crop up in that moment? Never been a goal of mine. Um, I was completely content in everything I did within the sport, proud of you know things we did in the wind tunnel, proud of cars that were put on the racetrack, 
I mean, I never uh, aspired to that um, because I I just didn't, right? I was I will, I didn't say I'm gonna you know I'm gonna be a crew chief one day. No, never did. And when I was put in that in that space, um, I truly saw it differently, and it was about people development. It wasn't about you know leading race cars. It was about developing other people to be better, and as a team, as a group of people working towards a common goal, we got there. Now, I used a lot of different techniques doing it. And I even talked with, you know, peers now, people who actually worked with me back in the day, who thought I was crazy. And now they look back and they go, now I understand why you did what you did. And thank you. So you've you've mentioned um, rules <laughs> a, a couple of times. Yeah. And you did tell me about getting caught one time with a big carburetor at Phoenix. <sighs> yeah. Who, who was that with? So uh, that was with, uh, that was on Team Renzi, right? So we had multiple cars back in the day trying to get into the cup realm. Uh, Ed Renzi and Sam Renzi had race teams. They had truck teams and, and bush teams. And uh, I evolved into a team manager at that point. Uh, on the cup side, on the well, it was over all of it. We had a cup team, a, 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 a bush team, and okay. a truck teams. Right. Okay. Right? Yeah. So I evolved into like a team manager o- over over these teams, and so we bought some cars from MB2 Motorsports, and went testing in in Homestead with Randy Tolsma, and uh, right front tire went down in testing, and Randy hit pretty hard. Uh, probably the hardest hit I've seen in a testing. Put the right front tire up in the passenger seat. It was it was a pretty pretty good blow, and you could kind of look at him at the time and go, "Yeah, he's looking at life different." Much like yeah. I looked at life different yeah. when we lost Mike, and uh, as a driver, when you lose that edge. A lot of other things evolve, like the motor's not strong enough, the chassis's not turning. So through that process, we went through some some people, some crew chiefs, and we got to Phoenix, and I had to let the crew chief go before we went to Phoenix. And so I took the the position as team manager. You know, we just need to get through the season. And we went into Phoenix not knowing that we were going to make the race. We really didn't believe in you know, we were. It was the team Marines forward that we had at Phoenix and I pulled the engine builder aside it was Peter Guile I pulled him aside and I was like Peter if we put a cup carburetor on this motor what's it going to do and he started laughing he goes yeah you're not putting a cup carburetor on that I said no I'm just asking a question now this, this is the bush this is a bush car now, who is the driver Bobby oh you- uh, Randy tells me. Okay. All right. right. And I said, if we put this carburetor on there, what's it going to do? And he goes, well, we're not putting that carburetor on there. I said, no, it's a hypothetical. Like, what's it going to do? And he goes, it's like 200 horsepower. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> he goes, 200. I said, okay. So if I can make this happen, can you get me a carburetor over here? And he goes, you can't make this happen. I go, give me a carburetor. So he went to the cup garage. Come back with a carburetor, right? So I pulled Ed Renzi aside, who is the car owner at the time. I said, I just want you to know what's getting ready to happen here. We're going to go on the racetrack. Driver's going to bitch about the motor, but we're going to do this. And he had a conversation with Peter and said, it's 200 horsepower more than anybody in the field. So when the carburetor people came around to inspect the carburetor, we did the dance, and the cup carburetor got on the engine without NASCAR seeing it, and they put a seal on it, and they sealed it. Okay, so it, tell me what the dance is. So they take we take the carburetor off. NASCAR inspects it. The, the quote-unquote legal carburetor. The legal one. Okay. All right. we, we take it off, 
right? And they inspect it. They check the size of the bore size. They do their gauges down in it. And then you stick the carburetor back on the engine. And then they bolt it down. And you seal it. Well, if you can distract the guy, they swap the carburetor and stick the <laughs> illegal carburetor on, right? And then seal it. But there's another catch to it because eventually they're going to inspect it again. Right. But, and we'll get to that, right? So um, we talked about talented people in the, in the, in the garage, and I'll, I'll speak more to the crew and how well they orchestrated some of the things that they did, they're talented guys. So we go out on the racetrack, and the first lap on the racetrack is this motor won't get out of its own way. And I looked at the owner, and the owner looked at me, and we just kind of shrugged and went, all right, let's do what we got to do. So through two practices, the car wouldn't turn. It just wouldn't turn in the middle, right? Now, is this with the, the illegal carburetor? The illegal carburetor. Okay, all right. He's just like, it won't turn. Well, we're not going fast enough to make the race anyway. So it really doesn't matter if it won't turn or not. It ain't good. So at that time, there were tall springs and short springs. Well, the tall springs had just become obsolete or illegal and we had to go back to a shorter spring and mike shiplett was the car chief and as most people know mike has moved on to be quite the crew chief very proud of that young man and everything he's done and mike was the car chief and i said hey mike do we have any tall springs on the on the truck and he said hey boss he goes yeah, you can't put tall springs in this thing i said look we're not going to make the race anyway. We got to get this thing to turn in the middle of the corner. We got to get the driver comfortable. We got to do what we got to do. And he was like, I got some. And I said, all right, put them in. So he puts these tall springs in the car. We go out, practice with these tall springs, and they don't, it don't—it ain't make a difference at all, right? And so really defeated, like we're not going to make the race. So we get out on the pit road for qualifying. I'm having a conversation with Randy. Put the window net up, slap the top of the hood, and I go, I need you to drive it in there. I need to drive it in there deep. We got to make the show. Fires the car up. Off pit road he goes. Well, this car's got 200 more horsepower than the field. <laughs> and you can hear it singing, Right. I'm getting goosebumps right now, even remembering, like thinking back that way. And he come past the start finish line, and we're standing down between one and two, because as most people know, back in that day, pit road circled all the way around. He drove that car in there, Rick, ten car lengths deeper than he had in practice the whole time. The difference is, is he just burped the throttle and got right back in the gas, and that thing went off the corner, and I went. Oh, shit. <laughs> right? And he came around, and the crowd screams, and it goes, on the pole. And I'm going, we were 42nd in practice for two practice sessions, and now we're on the pole. And the team goes nuts. And I'll never forget this. Sam Renzi's on the wall. He about falls off the wall, <laughs> jumping up and down. Right? And I'm thinking to myself, holy shit. I got an illegal carburetor. And I've got two illegal springs in this car. Mike Shiplett knew that the springs were in the car. And he comes over to me and goes, boss. I go, yeah, I know. I said, here's what I need you to do. Give me three people. Jack stands in the jack. We go through inspection. Just follow my lead. Well, thank God we got knocked off the pole and we were like third. Right? But still had to go through post inspection. Well, if you had two hundred more horsepower than everybody else, what did they have? What were they doing? <laughs> what kind of springs and, and carburetors yeah. did they have? Right. <laughs> so um, the guys jacked the car up, right? And I'm thinking to myself, this is not going to be good. And I'm not at this time. I'm really not even thinking about the carburetor. So the seal comes off the carburetor, the bolts come off the carburetor, the carburetor gets lifted up, and at that time, Chip was the NASCAR official. Chip Warren. Yeah, Chip was the guy. Oh, that's awesome. And so carburetor comes up off the thing. Chip puts his thing, his gauge under there, and he puts his gauge under there again, 
and he kind of turns his head and he kind of looks at me and he goes, what? And I said, I said, what are you talking about, Chip? <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, you owe me. And I said, thank you, Chip. Have a nice day. And Chip walked off. And I really? didn't know what that meant. Right. I'd never bribed him. I never. Yeah, he, yeah. He, right. And I was just like, Wow. I can't believe he let me go, right? And it's the relationships we have with our NASCAR officials, right? Because they're real people. They're no different than us. And about that time, this little NASCAR official comes sliding up from underneath the car that I didn't know who the guy was, right? And I knew most of the NASCAR officials in any garage area. And he comes sliding out. He goes, we got a problem. And I was like, what do you mean we got a problem? And he's like, the spring's in this car. I need the springs out of this car, so... Mike pulls the springs out of the car, and I go, what's wrong with the springs? He goes, the rules change. You can't have these springs. I go, when, I'm the team manager. I'm stepping in as the crew chief. How the hell am I supposed to keep up with your damn rules and all the things that you do? And he goes, I don't know to tell you. And he took the springs off to the trailer. And I was like, shit. So all of a sudden, I get the... NASCAR official says, they need you in the trailer. And I walk in, it's John Darby, Mike Helton, and Kevin Triplett. And my springs are sitting on the counter. The unholy trinity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the springs are sitting on the counter. And Mike goes, we got a problem here. I said, you're damn right we got a problem here. I said, the United States Marine Corps has just invaded Afghanistan. I've got the United States Marine Corps on my car. And I can't take this press. And Kevin Triplett started to speak up. And I started laughing. And Mike went, there's nothing funny here. And I said, with no disrespect, I said, when I look at Kevin Triplett, I see a show car driver at Richard Childress Racing. <laughs> right? <laughs> so when you have the relationships with these guys yeah. over the years, you yeah. know, you just have those relationships. Right? And it got real quiet. And they go, we get, we're in a pickle. I said, yeah. I said, when have I ever been in this trailer? And they said, never. And I go, because you've never caught me. I said, you didn't catch me. I need to get a car in the field. It's United States Marine Corps. And they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you to the tail end of the field and say that there was some, not illegal, but there was some equipment failures. And you're going to tell everybody that that's what happened, and we're not going to speak of this ever. And I go, thank you, gentlemen. And I walked out of the trailer. And I'll never forget, I walked up to the back of the hauler, and they were like, what's going on? And I said, <clears throat> um, we're in the race. We're going to start from the tail end but we're in the race. Well, what happened? We're not going to speak about it. And I, I really haven't told that story until now to a whole lot of people. Um, there were, you know, the car owner knew, the, the engine builder knew. Eventually, Sam Renzi, the, the other car owner, found out about it. But that was truly the only time that I really got caught because, you know, cheating is a past tense word. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're interpreting the rules. You, you you made it very plain that it's not cheating until you get caught. You're right. Okay. All right. <laughs> so did you did did Chip ever get his uh reward or yeah. uh never he never asked for it. So you didn't you didn't have to pay or the team or whoever didn't have to pay any kind of fine. Nope. Just had to go to the back of the pack. Back of the pack. And that was at Phoenix in 01? That would have probably been 01. Okay, because if that was Afghanistan, that would have been yeah, 01. That would have been 01, yeah. Yeah. 